I think it's on now, though. Jessica Clark can hear. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, I believe we're we're good. Troubleshooting done. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I I appreciate it, Josh. Do you think I should start from the beginning? Um. Do you want to do the pledge again? No, I don't think we need no. to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did the pledge, and that's that's up. That's up. Yes. Um, but do you think we should do the roll call again, or it's probably not a bad to... idea. Okay. All right. So we'll do the roll call again. And actually, Mary, um, sorry to interrupt. If you want. There are other people on the call. If we want to take them, we'll queue them up for public comment. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so we'll do the, this is um, the Region 15 Board of Education meeting budget workshop for Wednesday, March 25th, 2020. We're just going to do a roll call so we know who is present um, for, the, for the meeting. Um, Heather Rogers. Here. Heather Dwyer. Here. Steve Seriani. Here. Okay. Um, Shannon Cavallo. Here. John Cookson. Here. Brian Watson. Here. Peter Vaccarelli. Here. Richard Spirito. Here. Sharon Attic. Present. Um, I'm Marion Manzo, and we also I see uh, Josh Smith, Joe Martino. Uh, Carrie Chiapetta, uh, Jessica Chiaretto, and Jennifer Meglio. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to the public hearing portion of the meet of the agenda. Um, at this time, the Board of Education will recognize citizens of Middlebury and Southbury, and citizens are asked to state their name, their town of residence, and to limit their comments to three minutes. Are there any callers on? Yep. Okay, so, so I have, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. I'm just going to say that um, I believe that um, Steve, you are caller five in the window here. Um, and Jen Meglio is caller one, just for the record. Um, I will not mute Steve's phone. Um, I do have one email that came in as far as public comment that I can read into the record. Um, Would you like me to wait for that, or do you want me to go ahead? Yep, yep, you go, yep, you go ahead. I'm sorry, but there's like someone saying there, there's a volume issue again. I'm just trying to address that. Hold on a second. On the um, web feed? Yeah. yeah. Heather Rogers, can you check and hear it again? Or are we? Yeah. Are we, yeah. Let, me, let me mute you guys on here. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is an audio check for the... If they started earlier, maybe they got the the last time we had trouble, but I just checked it and it works fine. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much, Heather. All right, Josh, if you could read that comment, that would be great. Sure, I did not get the address, but we will look it up for the record. Uh, the okay. email was from um, Christine Kubation. She wanted the board to consider bringing parking fees to $150 uh, 
uh, per student, which is still 50% higher than the Durig average, but more in range with what they charge. All right, and I haven't gotten any other emails, and it looks like there's no one else that's calling in? That is correct. Okay. Um, so we will move on um, to the next item on the agenda is the uh, presentation, the 2020-2021 um, school budget impact from the governor's executive orders and Mr. Josh Smith. Uh, I lost my uh, agenda here for a moment. Do you want me to go through the Board of Finance questions as well? Oh, <coughs> yes. You know, why don't you... Um, I must have the, I must have an earlier agenda. I apologize. Why don't you go ahead and, and go through the questions and answers? I apologize. That's okay. And these were um, originally scheduled as part of the Board of Finance um, joint meeting. Um, due to the current conditions, we changed that meeting where the boards of finance from both towns submitted questions to Mr. Martino and I over the last few days. We took their questions, we put them into um, this presentation, we answered those questions. Um, also in here, we had a few questions from board members that had come in that we built into here. Um, some of this is for the record and for folks turning in at home, um, but these were slides from earlier presentations. Just a reminder that um, cost efficiencies built into the current proposed budget were um, energy savings from our first two solar projects, uh, there's staffing reorganization. We are in the process of replacing our financial software, which will go live on July 1. Um, the upgrade to our student information system, which will move to a cloud-based um, system. Same, uh, same software, just moved to a cloud-based, and that will prevent um, or further prevent um, ransomware. And then we have some enrollment-driven staffing reductions. Um, some of the challenges we face, it's not lost on anybody on the board side that our um, medical rate has increased fairly significantly, that the rising costs of special ed, um, some of that is what it, we're spending this year and as we roll that into next year's budget, those were non-budgeted items for special ed that we're uh, experiencing during the 1920 school year. Um, Next year is the last year of the early retirement incentive um, and then long-term costs that we continue to watch and work to address. Um, every year there are certain assumptions we make. These are things that when we start the budget process um, happen every single year. We have no choice in how we address these or that with the need to address these on an annual basis. Um, some non-controllable costs, things outside of uh, school district's ability to influence. Um, the enrollment uh, projected for next year, again, this is the same slide from the original presentation uh, from February 24th. Um, hold on one second. Um, Oh, interesting. Hold on a second. What I'm realizing is that I am sharing this presentation with the public, but not the board. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. There we go. Great. Got it. Now you guys can see? Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, these are the projected class sizes um, for next year. Uh, they are also the class sizes of the current year. The number of teachers budgeted per section K-5. These are the district class size averages um, projected for next year versus what we have this year. This year is on the left, next year is on the right. A reminder that um, about 75 78 percent, see, we do it this way. 
Um, of our budget is staffing and benefits. The projected salary increases um, with changes built in are about a little less than 3%. Uh, some of our health care increase has been offset by other insurance. So while the health insurance increased substantially, um, our life insurance, for example, uh, we saw some reductions. So that's why um, the insurance actuary projected about a 10% budget increase. Um, the actual impact to the budget is approximately 8.7 um, because of those shifts in other non-health insurance uh, accounts. Um, that is kind of uh, summarized on this slide here as to the different types of insurance. Uh, again, a summary of the things that are in this year's budget, the shift to some stronger um, checks and balances uh, around human capital management, the financial system, the move to cloud services, the upgrade to the phone system, um, the safety and security capabilities, the instructional team leaders in music, PE and health, the teacher in residency, which we can speak a little more tonight. Um, and that's really to push uh, and help the rest of our school district really focus on cultural competencies. This is not an FTE uh, increase. I'll show. I'll talk to that a little later. Curriculum and instruction audit, the consolidation of licensing, and the uh, English learner instruction increase. Um, staffing. Uh, this is what drives our budget. The net budget change is a reduction um, of two certified staff and one uh, addition in non-certified staff. How that works out in actual dollars, you'll see the additions on the top, the reductions on the bottom for a total net impact of staffing uh, to reduction of uh, just um, south of $100,000 in staff reductions. The revenue, uh, this has been a topic of conversation for the last few years of what revenue does the district take in and how is that revenue uh, collected. These grants are, a com or this is a combination of uh, federal and state grants and funds collected from the public. This is the overall budget summary of how we get to the 359 and the breakout of each of those accounts. This is the that same information broken down um, into cost center. Uh, some of, we start now with the question um, here. Um, does the teachers union support the hiring of the teacher in residence? Um, and the, the answer is that this is one of the teachers from our district. So we will take a teacher that's already involved in the equity and cultural diversity work happening in the district. We, that we, the expectation of that teacher will be to work with other staff in the district and promote the good work happening in some of our classrooms so that it happens in other classrooms. Um, that teacher will um, not lose any status or um, years of service or salary or anything like that. It's the, it's the same as whatever teacher. There's, there's uh, certainly a, a good amount of teachers in this district doing this work now. And so we would look to have one of those teachers fill this teacher in residency. And then um, just like we have teachers on medical leave or other types of leave, a year-long sub would be put in their classroom. Currently, we have um, 
a substantial number of long-term subs in our district that we feel are doing a really good job um, and would expect that one of those folks um, mm -hmm. would backfill the position, depending, of course, on what school and, and subject area um, that teacher came from. I can pause at the end of each one of these in case there's any board members that have questions. The only thing is the way my screen is set up now, I can't see. So I don't know, Marion, if you um, yeah, let me know. Yeah, I'm happy to, to let you know if anyone is raising their hands. Okay. Oh, we got a question from Steve. Uh, so the, the, the net cost for the teacher and residents then would essentially be the, the cost of the sub, depending on who that, that sub is. That's correct. Is that correct? And the funding for that would come out of our existing subline, so there's no additional cost in the budget to make this happen. But presumably, like, you know, would still need another sub. Like, you'd still, like, if you move a sub up to, you know, to replace this teacher in residence, you've got to get another sub in to co cover teachers that are just, you know, out sick or something. Right. Correct. When we looked at our current substi certified substitute line, we feel that we have enough in there to, to do that. But you're right. So if we take like whatever person's in this classroom for a year isn't available to go somewhere else. And then um, so I understand that you're not increasing the line item from last year. What would happen to that line item if there's a surplus this year, next year, any year? What happens? So it probably depends a little bit on other things happening in the district. In some years, any surplus in the or any unexpended amount in the certified subline would be transferred to cover another line or added to the capital reserve. Um, those are usually one of the two options that the district's done in the past. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're good. Uh, yep, let's see, uh, Brian Watson. Sure. Brian Watson, I have a follow-up question. So is it the long-term plan to have this as a permanent position, or is this a one-year, one-and-done kind of position? I think the question, and um, Dr. Chiapetta can weigh in if she wants to add more, I think this is um, new for us and, and, and a position that doesn't exist in a lot of districts. And so what we talked about doing originally was bringing in some outside consultants to help and support our teachers with this but in as we went through the conversation we have such good um, capacity within the district that we didn't feel we could actually hire somebody from another district that would be able to step in and and uh, push the work or support the work of the um, global citizenship committee so that's where we would look inside I think your question is a good one um, we weren't ready at this point to commit to a long, like a full-time position. I don't know if this is a full-time long-term position um, or something else. And so what we thought that next year we would do this as a teacher in residency, see if it's working, and then make a decision whether or not this was a full-time position, a part-time position, structured like an ITL type position, or something that we need to build into future budgets. Okay. Uh, so the next question um, is that um, about professional development and how do uh, we budget to provide professional development for teachers outside the district. Um, and for the most part, the majority of any professional development that happens outside of the school district, that is not in the operating budget. That comes from uh, both Title II and Title IV, those are federal entitlement grants the district receives. They do not offset any costs for the budget, um, and they cannot be used to supplant or take things out of the budget. These are things that happen in addition to the school district's budget. Historically, these haven't shown up ever in an operating budget because they're not operating costs, and they can't be used to reduce operating costs. So the Title II grant is approximately $56,000. The Title IV grant is uh, approximately $10,000. Um, and they primarily go to support teachers' attendance in um, out-of-district conferences, workshops, other professional development opportunities. Um, and then, as you heard Dr. Jones speak, um, 
each what we did this year was take professional development dollars and allocate it to each of the departments in the high school so one there's more transparency but there's also more teacher based control over the allocation of those development dollars Okay. Um, how many Chromebooks would we need to complete the long-term plan for Chromebooks at the high school and what would the cost be? Uh, so in this year's budget, we have one uh, cart of Chromebooks allocated to the high school that's yet to be purchased. We're holding back on that purchase in part to see what happens with uh, our finances over the, the rest of the year. Um, and the fact that students aren't in class right now doesn't you know, add any urgency to making that purchase happen shorter. Um, total, we need seven carts over the next uh, three years, if you include this year, to kind of fulfill the technology uh, plan at the high school. So there's one in this year's budget, there's three in the proposed budget for next year, there's three in the proposed budget, or three that we would need to purchase in the following year's budget um, we budget approximately $7,000 per cart. So total to complete the request of the high school technology plan would be $42,000. No, it would be $49,000. Because seven times seven is not 42. Any uh, questions on that? Other than a fourth grade math question, second grade math question. <laughs> um, the Board of Finance asked a question about the hiring of an auditor to do an educational budget review. Um, District Management Group or DMG uh, comes out of Massachusetts and does this kind of work. Um, at this point, we, ha we made the decision to look at a curriculum and instruction audit for next year. Um, several of us in the district have worked with DMG in the past, um, have a, a pretty good idea of the kinds of areas they look at for cost savings. Uh, the DMG audit specific is uh, usually pretty expensive, um, getting into six figures. Um, and right now we don't feel that the return on investment of that type of, invest of, that type of cost um, is gonna give us the results that would actually show up in budgetary reductions. Doesn't mean we're opposed to it, but at this point, I think that um, the four central office administrators have all had touch points with them, uh, but I'm not sure that the reductions that they would suggest are ones that one, we haven't already made or have community context that haven't worked in other districts. Um, we can speak specific, but some of their reductions, um, although from a accounting standpoint makes sense, um, are not ones that the public's willing to support. Um, and so at this point, we're, we don't feel that the cost for that audit is, is worthwhile. Um, Jess, I have a, a question. This is Mary and Manzo. Can you explain a little bit more what a district management group is? They're a consult, yeah, they're a consulting group out of Boston. Okay, and, and do they do specific types of audits or? Um, they offer a wide range of service. Um, one thing that they do do are education budget audits. It's one of their uh, myriad of services. You can join them almost like you can uh, like CABE or other professional organizations. And one of the services they offer is a budget review. The okay. districts that I'm aware of that use them paid between seventy-five dollars and $100,000 for that budget review. Um, and I'm not saying that it may have been... Um, issue appropriate or time appropriate for those districts at this point it's not something that we feel is really warranted in region 15. Okay. Um, Non-certified and certified staff qualify for a district pension. Um, as of July 1 any new staff to the district in a non-certified position will be in a uh, defined contribution plan. Uh, the pension committee meets on a regular basis to review the pension plan and any projections on that pension plan. Currently, we have 101 people in our um, that are receiving pension benefits. Um, we have gone to bid for the management of our pension investment fund that's currently open uh, with a deadline for proposals. Um, 
one of the concerns brought by the pension committee was our funding level. We talked about this before. On the next slide, I'll show um, the current funding and our uh, increase in our contribution to kind of flatten the um, curve on that pension side. Um, and just a point of clarification, is that any certified staff in the district, any teaching staff or education staff, um, don't, do not qualify or pay into the district's pension fund? That's all through the teacher retirement fund, and that's managed by the state. There's no obligation uh, on the town or district side for the teacher retirement system. And this is that chart we spoke about about uh, a month ago, um, that currently our um, pension funding rate is 66%. Um, we've increased our contribution in next year's budget by $30,000. Um, so instead of a $900,000 contribution annually, we will make a $930,000 contribution, um, which will move the um, goal to 80% funding. Um, and then if we continue to, so this would be if we continued at a $30,000 uh, increase over time, uh, kind of con con uh, controlling for other market factors. Um, and then we could shorten the time to hit 80% funded um, if, uh, if we increase that amount, 80% um, funded is higher than most school districts uh, fund at, um, but a, a rate that is um, comfortable by the pension committee standards. Any questions on pension? Um, one of the questions the Board of Finance uh, submitted was have we looked at the debt that the region currently has. Um, about a month ago on the Finance Committee, we talked about our current debt uh, and some bids to restructure that debt. Um, this is the chart from that Finance Committee meeting with our current debt, uh, the current interest due, principal, um, and then projected savings based on refinancing. Obviously, the bond market is uh, fluid right now, um, and mm -hmm. so the banks are recommending that we do not pull the trigger on any type of refinancing just yet. Um, however, we think that between now and June, uh, this is some restructuring that we would do. Any questions on debt in Region 15? Unlike other school districts, as a regional district, we carry our own debt. Um, most municipal school districts, the town would carry the debt. Um, one of the suggestions was that we review our monthly and quarterly expenditures during the year. I, uh, I would point out to the public and anybody watching that monthly the Board of Education has a finance subcommittee that meets. At each of those meetings, we review the monthly expenditures. Um, and other financial um, topics facing the board. All of the minutes from those meetings and any handouts are posted on the website and we put the link in this presentation. The presentation will be online um, tomorrow. Um, can line items be reduced or eliminated in next year's budget? Um, I would say that right now we're in the um, process of migrating our current financial software to the new system. I think that we've talked a little bit about redundancy of some of the object lines, some of the um, confusion or lack of transparency in some of the descriptions of some of the supply lines in the district. So as we move to the new system, uh, we can clean up some of that. Um, I would also say that um, Currently, we are in the process of going through every line that we have, looking at the impact. We talked a little bit about this on uh, Monday night um, and what expenses will we not incur between now and the end of the school year um, that may be able to offset and reduce some costs in next year's budget. Um, sorry, I'm getting some... Um, Electricity and energy costs. Um, what rates are we using for energy? Do we have a broker? Um, are we looking at any Eversource or uh, LED programs and any state or federal grants? Um, 
I would say that our current rate is there about um, uh, 0 0.08 uh, that's our supply side rate. We do use a broker to negotiate that rate. Um, every school in the district has been part of an LED project <coughs> or is slotted to be a part of one. Um, PHS and GS have not been completed yet. Um, and then the two solar projects, uh, RMS is online. Longmeadow, I think by the end of next week, um, they'll be looking to uh, complete and uh, get that project online. We don't have an ETA yet on an official uh, generation period by the time they get Long Meadow, but it's moving along very quickly. Um, how do we address transportation costs? Currently, we're in year two, and next year will be year three of a five-year contract for general ed student transportation. Um, that was entered into August, um, the month before I came on board. Um, about uh, in every year of that contract, there is a uh, cost increase. The budgeted increase next year is four and a half percent and again that was part of the negotiated contract. Um, in the spring of last year we did go out to bid on all of our special ed transportation runs. Any transportation questions before we move on? Um, the prevalence rate around special education um, I would just point people to the presentation by um, Dr. Shiretto that went into pretty good detail about all the services, um, our rates, uh, identification rates compared to the state and compared to other districts over time. Um, and as far as savings that we can leverage, I would say one in that presentation, they talk about some of that savings. Um, but this year, uh, we brought social workers into the district. Uh, with a significant cost savings and improvement of services. Uh, we also have a Wellspring program at Palm Park High School providing clinical psychology services that um, brought students into the district and is a big offset to cost. Uh, teacher aids and increasing class size. Um, I had the class size projections earlier in this presentation. Uh, it's based on demographers and enrollment projections. We did have a situation this year, for example, um, where the actuals came in higher than projected and we did put a paraprofessional in that class before, instead of um, creating a new class. Uh, but this isn't, we don't do that in every single case automatically. It would be case by case. Timing would matter. Grade level would matter. Space would matter. Um, it's more than just uh, a class size conversation. Um, and I would point out that we do have a reduction of three full-time positions in next year's budget. Um, these are the class size optimals that the Board of Ed has functioned under for um, a decade or more. Um, and although we don't stick hard and fast to them, we do use them as general guidelines when we look at class size. Uh, Steve Suriani has a question. Sure. Thank you. This is Steve. So Josh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, please. So generally speaking, the, we'll call it the educational strategy, if you will, is that, you know, the, the best thing, you know, we can do for meeting a lot of our other goals, our district goals, whether it be increased scores or, or, um, uh, you know, global citizenship and character, a whole lot, all those goals, you know, we need a classroom teacher that is first and foremost the person that can provide the primary support, the best support. So we wouldn't, I don't know if the question was sort of like, hey, can you put more kids in the classroom and sort of supplement the teacher's work with aids? I mean, if so, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a good idea or correct or am I, or something we might, some, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think that all the research shows that the most important person in the classroom is a highly qualified teacher um, and that there is a, probably a lot of research on what class size means to that, but certainly in a time where our teachers are being able to address more and more topics far beyond that of kind of quote just the curriculum um, or just academics, the more students you put in a classroom, the more complicated that becomes. Um, and while, you know, I think class sizes, there, there is a sweet spot, I think, when you get really small classes of seven, that creates different problems um, where you may not have a variety of voices 
um, but certainly just putting more students in a class uh, makes it harder for teachers to know their students and to address all of the variety of needs we're asking them to address. And then, uh, generally speaking, I mean, not for purposes of, say, this budget, but, I mean, those guidelines have been that way for as long as I can remember. Um, is it worth for PNC, you know, to sort of look at the bigger picture, you know, if if those are guideline, you know, you know, how, you know, I don't know why it's 18 for K to one at this point. I'm not saying it should or shouldn't be. I just, you know, I don't know where that 18 came from. So maybe it is worth um, recalibrating this. Yeah, I think um, Carrie or Jessica, please feel free yeah. to weigh in. But um, I would say that our class sizes are within um, the range of our peers and the expectations of our community. Um, it doesn't, you can always revisit them, um, but I don't know that they're skewed or outliers in what other communities in districts like ours uh, look at. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Sharon Attic has a question. Hi, this is Sharon Attic. Question um, on class size projections. So I would imagine, I recognize this is very, very fluid and you're analyzing potential data on an ongoing basis. Um, given the fact of the current situation we're in, um, I would imagine that things like uh, kindergarten registration will be postponed that were planned for April, which I would imagine would have given a strong indicator about potential uh, student enrollment. And of course that would you know, ebb and flow as we get closer to the school year. Given that climate um, and your current projections that are that you've shown tonight, do you still feel confident that those numbers are pretty much on point, or would you would you tend to see some ebb and flow coming out of that registration? I'm just trying to get a sense of how you make adjustments, um, how that information comes to you, and will there be a risk to have greater influx given the fact that? that some of the activities that would normally give you some of that data are potentially postponed. So when I jump back to our class size projections, um, kindergarten is the most volatile um, place for enrollment. And you're correct in that kindergarten registration gives us the most amount of data. Uh, that being said, we do know um, the students that are in our own preschools and we do have um, a fairly decent uh, accounting of what preschools in the community have four-year-olds um, and we have historic trend data. Um, if you'll notice that our kindergartens right now um, being uh, budgeted at 15 um, with the, and 16 with the exception of Gainfield, um, we have space to absorb some students if our projections are off. Um, if Gainfield, for example, is the one that becomes problematic and if our projections are significantly off, we could run the risk. Um, that being said, we felt that the projection of 57 kindergartners is um, an outlier from where their historical registration's been. Um, and that was even when we built the budget um, a few months ago, we felt that um, even the 19 projected that we're gonna be south of that number at Gainfield based on historics. Um, but your question's a good one. Um, we're gonna continue to watch it. Um, I think that we've, we haven't been overly aggressive, you know, um, in our kindergarten projections with the idea that we're gonna err on the side of uh, conservation when it comes to class size and allow some room for it to grow. Um, I would say that the challenge is almost the other way, um, that for example, um, I'm not really worried about Middlebury Elementary going down to, to two students, but if you look at Long Meadow or PES, um, if we had say 10 or 12 less kindergartners register, would you reduce a section and go from four to three? Um, we wouldn't do that until August, in part because um, especially PES, um, you have more students registering late in the summer. Um, and I'd hate to say in July that we're gonna reduce a kindergarten teacher because um, of low enrollment and then have 20 students show up in August and not be able to accommodate and have to scramble. So that's kind of our thinking on that process. 
Thank you. Yeah, and Heather Rogers has a question. Hi, this is Heather Rogers. Um, I did have a question or more probably a comment on the class sizes. Um, I don't think it's as simple as increasing class sizing, class sizes and adding a paraprofessional. My main concern with the increased class sizes is that we encourage movement and collaboration. Um, and that gets harder with each student we add. And also, as Mr. Smith had said, the classroom teacher is the person we want doing the teaching and the paraprofessional is there for support. And I don't think it would be wise to change our classroom size goals or even to open that up at this point, um, especially given what's going on now and the fact that next year could be quite challenging. All right, thank you. Any other questions? No? All set? Okay. World language instruction. One question that was an, was asked was about uh, Spanish and whether it was the most popular language being offered and did we need another teacher for it? Um, and can we teach other languages via Ro uh, Rosetta Stone versus adding teachers for those languages? I would say that currently Spanish is the most um, enrolled language that we have. However, our expected class size um, doesn't necessitate additional teachers for Spanish. Um, we are adding that 0.4 Italian teacher at the high school to continue the Spanish one class that was up there this year. Um, and with um, high school enrollment already happening, we do know there's enough interest to support that Italian class. Um, teaching students via Rosetta Stone instead of a teacher um, is a debated topic right now. Um, it has been for, for a while. Um, the short answer is that there are labor contracts in place that would prevent us from completely replacing programs with online learning that didn't require any type of instructor from the district. Questions on language instruction? No. Has the uh, district considered using uh, retired uh, police as opposed to full-time officers? And the short answer is yes, we have, and yes, we do. Um, that all of the uh, security personnel in the district are retired police officers. Um, the only active duty police officers that we have um, on, uh, that we fund through the operating budget are really um, the traffic control because our uh, ASOs cannot do that. Um, and uh, we have the rovers that move between the um, schools as additional. Um, but we do not pay um, for, for a full police officer to be in the district. Uh, the the uh, SRO at the high school is uh, something that the town covers. Questions on that? No. Okay. Um, the hiring of permanent substitute teachers versus daily subs. Um, and the short answer is that's a good idea and we are doing it. Um, currently every school has at least one permanent substitute assigned to their building. Um, and that shows up there every day. That is more cost effective for us. Um, and it provides more consistency for the schools and the students. Um, the part time, the hiring of part time teachers, um, is, something that we pay attention to um, and when it's appropriate we will do that but currently there's a teaching shortage in the state in many subject areas and offering like a 0.8 position um, is really difficult to attract staff and it's certainly difficult to re um, retain them that if they get the offer of a full-time position um, they'll leave us for that position that being said um, what we try to do is hire full-time teachers and make sure they have a full-time schedule. We're not going to have uh, full-time teachers just because it's convenient that they'll have a full, full workload. No, I thought maybe because of this, it's business, so will not come in. That's what I meant. I'm sorry, who's that speaking? <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure who that was. Okay. 
that was speaking. So we probably do. Oh. It's fine. We do have a couple of um, call-ins, that which is fine. It's a public meeting. We would just ask them to mute their audio. Um, are other regions keeping their budgets flat uh, year over year? Um, we monitor this. We talk to other districts daily about where they are with their budgets, what the trends are. Um, there's a range currently um, that go from zero to 6.8. Um, and oftentimes there's very local things. So in some of those districts, they have building projects which are driving up their annual cost. So, some like us have insurance costs that may go up or down substantially from year to year. Um, and debt payments. One thing that is unique to regional school districts is debt. So when there is a bond that's paid off in some districts, and this is true of some close to us, uh, when that bond is paid off, um, that bond payment is not in their budget the next year. And so if that's a $600,000 bond payment, that could almost offset the entire increase of 1% to 3% for a school district to the community. Um, so when you see the numbers um, of surrounding communities, there's a story behind all of those. Um, and again, we would ask people to look at what's in our budget um, and what the reason for those increases are and not necessarily the number itself uh, when you look to compare apples to apples. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, obviously we're very much aware of the financial implications of everything happening um, globally right now. and what we're going to do um, to absorb some of the cost out of next year's budget um, and what we can do is something that uh, we talk daily on. I would say that we're only you know a couple of weeks into this. Um, literally there is legislation and executive orders daily that will impact all of the things that we're talking about. Um, Joe and I talked to people every single day about what the what's happening what could happen what issues we should be looking at um, and we will be able to provide a plan for the board and some opportunity um, but I would say that at this point in time it's a little premature to, to talk specific numbers um, the biggest question out there is transportation costs currently we have about a million dollars in transportation that's allocated for next for the remainder of this year um, there's legislation in Hartford now that may mandate we pay that bill in full. Um, and there's uh, every other opinion of whether or not that's good for the state, for the unemployment insur uh, the unemployment line, for the keeping companies solvent, um, how you allocate taxpayer dollars. So that's literally a million dollar conversation to us. Um, and if we pay a part of that, all of that, or none of that, has a significant impact on our ability to offset costs in next year's budget. So I would say it's very much premature to uh, make a proposal for the reallocation of any transportation dollars. However, in the next week to three weeks, I think we'll have some answers on that. Any um, questions? I see a question from Heather Dwyer. <clears throat> since you brought it up. <laughs> um, I, I've been thinking a lot about the, the current situation that we're in and how it impacts the budget. And it does, um, it, you know, it does concern me that the, the conversation <coughs> tends to be closer to, you know, well, we're going to save some money because we don't have school right now. Um, and what are we going to do with that savings? Um, and to, to me, the thing that is weighing heavily on me is what are the needs of the students going to be when they come back? Um, I don't think, even if we don't have to pay some of these bills, that this is a, a zero-cost event necessarily for the students. Um, and I just, I, I guess I wanted to see what your thoughts were. Um, but also that I hope that we keep this in mind as we're evaluating the budget. Um, I, you know, I, I just, it's hard two weeks in, 
um, and without knowing where the end is to be forward looking. Um, but, the, but that's on my mind. Thank you. I think that's 100% appropriate. You know, I think that we take our job is to not only manage the now, but to look ahead and see what's coming, what the impact is, what the potential um, problems may be. I think the idea of uh, not just the compensatory educational piece, which we um, think of frequently, um, and um, uh, and that impact to next year, but also what is it that in uh, SRBI services or other type of student services are we going to need to increase um, as next year starts? Um, and I think one of the challenges is that um, everything's moving really fast now and people are making a lot of very quick decisions without necessarily understanding the, the legs or fingers something has and the unintended consequences. Um, and so we're trying to tread lightly um, and step carefully um, as to where we, we go and what, um, and what we, decisions we make. Um, and that's why I wouldn't say today that there's a, a, an offset that I could give you because I don't want to talk about something that a week or two from now may not be viable. Um, like I said, every day there's decisions coming out of Hartford and Washington, in, uh, interpretations and decisions by attorneys as to what all of this means. Um, and we don't want to make a decision that one of those executive orders is going to undo. Um, so I don't have a, a, there's not an easy answer to that other than um, Joe, Carrie, Jessica, and I every day are talking to. Uh, districts, state department, legislators, um, lobbyists, um, you know, other people in our groups uh, trying to figure out where some of those holes might be and what's appropriate. Um, the, like I said, the transportation one was literally um, information flying back and forth as to what legislation was proposed, who's proposing it, the likelihood of it passing, 100%, 80%, 50%, stay out of our business, um, save unemployment. I mean, those things are going back and forth very quickly. And so I wouldn't want to come tonight and say, hey, we haven't paid our um, transportation bill yet, so let's do these things with it. Um, or let's uh, not build in services for next spring. Um, before, I, Steve has his hand up, but before um, we get to that, just wanted to say, Richard, um, if you could put your mic on mute, I think that would help a lot because we we're hearing a lot um, of background noise um, for you. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. No worries. All right. Um, next question was Steve Siriani. Yes. Hi, this is Steve. So, um, Josh, again, since since you brought it up, and you don't have to answer this now, but I think maybe at some point in today's meeting, so. We're going to be voting on the on the budget eventually, um, so I guess you know, I'm sure when we actually do that is still in flux. But whenever we do that, we're going to need to make the decision with the best information we have at the time, right? So um, I guess we'd be looking to you for guidance on that whole process, right? So. Um, and, and some of those decision items, you know, really may influence how I might look at the budget if, um, you know, I knew that we were um, going to have large, unforce, you know, unplanned, you know, you were anticipating more expenses or you were anticipating, you know, some savings. So that would just be something I'd be interested in, sort of the timeline on how we're going to go about this. I think that's the next yeah, agenda yeah, item. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Perfect. Stay tuned. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, All right. Available grants. Um, I think that uh, we list below here the grants that we receive um, that specifically offset our current budget. Um, and then the grants that aren't necessarily here, as I said before, like the Title II one, um, aren't, we're not allowed to supplant our budget with those grants. Uh, meaning take something out of our budget to pay for with one of those grants. Um, but these are the grants that we have to offset cost. 
So none of those costs go to the local taxpayer because of the funding we take in from the outside. All right, any, any oh. questions? Okay, um, are we going to uh, spend down towards the end of the year to get to zero? And this I think implies that there are um, districts that, and I would say this is probably more of a, on the municipal side that if they don't expend their budgets, go back to the towns. Um, and so they make sure that they end at a zero every year. That's not how we operate here, that we don't necessarily um, deliberately spend down our accounts uh, to get to zero. Um, we do delay projects, as I said, even that laptop cart earlier, or the Chromebook cart earlier that we delayed purchasing, um, just because once we spend on um, a project, I can't then recoup if something um, unexpected comes. So we usually wait as, for some of the capital projects uh, to later in the year to make sure that we can afford them and that there aren't uh, unexpen unexpected expenses in other lines. Um, and then if there is anything left, then that normally would go um, into our capital reserve. Typically that's not been a large amount, uh, which is why our capital reserve is pretty low right now. Um, but as of now, we can put 1% of our budget or up to 700,000 into that capital account. If we were to ever end a year with more than that 700,000, then it would go back to the communities. Questions on that? Mm -hmm. Nope, I think okay. we're good. Um, have we considered having some lecture courses at the high school um, as a way of reducing staff? Uh, I would say that some of our courses, uh, band, chorus, PE, theater, they run with large numbers already um, in their classes. We have um, you know, one band director and he handles the whole band, which is you know, well over 100 students. Um, uh, and we were at the theater production that I can't even count the number of students that were there with one theater teacher. So we do have some of those kind of large classes. We do have <coughs> um, a lecture room in the high school, um, but I think all of the educators on the line tonight would agree that class sizes of 100 um, are not that instructionally effective and that even at the college level, this is a practice that's um, used more sparingly than it may once have been. We have a question from Steve Suriani. Uh, yeah, so I think that just kind of again comes back to the other question about class size where um, we are running a high school, we're not really running a college, and the whole really what we've been moving to, I think, not um, are we moving away from you know sort of the lecture style classes. Not that we had huge lecture classes, but the, the teaching style is no longer lecture based. So we can't ask people to work in groups or do projects or do this or do that when um, you know, there's so many in a classroom. And um, I can, you know, when there's a lot in a classroom, I just, I just think it runs counter. Having a lecture style classroom um, as sort of the standard um, uh, or even just to do it to save money sort of is, is not where I would want to save money. I think it flies in the face of, of really what we've been trying to do over the years. And I can um, tell you, just having gone on tours with my daughter to college, we were at a couple state universities and you know we asked them flat out and they said, you, know, you might have a large lecture class here and there, but they too echoed that that's really not the norm anymore. And I think every class size I've looked at and you know, um, for the schools my daughter's been looking at, from big state schools to um, right down to, uh, you know, like a Southern, the, you know, the average class sizes are maybe in the twenties and the student teacher ratios are one to 13, maybe one to 17. And it seems like that's, that's everywhere, yeah, every college, you know, across the gamut. So I think, I think we're, I think, in my opinion, I think our thinking is, is in line with what we want our high school to be and kind of really where colleges are at. So I, I would echo your, your take on that, Josh. Yeah, I think, look, 78% of our budget is staffing and benefits. So, I mean, there is this pressure between fiscally responsible, 
fiscally conservative, if you will, uh, reducing the impact to the local community to the greatest extent versus building an educational structure that is high achieving. Um, and not, just that, not that class size in itself will make you a high achieving district, um, but those are pressures that, um, that we have to try to balance. And so I do think, you know, I appreciate the question from the boards of finance, and I think that it's something that we can answer. Um, at the same time, I, I don't want them to think that we don't pay any attention and just drive for, for lower class sizes without understanding the economic impact. Um, this one's a little more nuanced. Um, I think the Board of Ed has spent a lot of time on this. So the question was about the test results um, being in the 70s in elementary and dropping when they get to the eighth grade. The um, problem with that question is that it was not looking at um, performance rates. It was really looking at um, the growth targets. Um, and I think that that's something that we spent a lot of time on this year that our overall performance rates range from 77% in grade three to 76% in grade eight for math and 85 um, in grade three for, um, I think I just reversed that. Literacy was the first one, math, the 85 to 64, um, which was on par with our DERG. But again, we're not happy, and we've been talking about this for the two years that I've been here, um, is about math instruction and moving the good work that's happened K-5 in um, kind of uh, curriculum practice and migrating that curriculum professional development to the middle school. Um, and all the work that we've talked about um, has really been about that migration. Um, and we've talked about growth rates again for the two years that I've been here. So I would encourage people, and I think I put this on the next slide, but um, we could talk for two or three hours on this topic. Um, and actually we have, so if you go to the district performance report um, that Dr. Chiapetta did earlier this year, I think you can un uh, understand and, and dig deep into a lot of that data. But I don't know if there's any, again, my, my screen minimized. Any questions that board members want to ask? Okay. No, no questions. Um, is it um, necessary for the high school to have approximately 150 different classes for students? Um, so I would say that the first thing is that we don't run all 150 classes every semester. Um, that, that is really based on uh, interest and enrollment. Uh, when not enough students uh, enroll in some of those classes, they don't run. So we don't run them all. The other side of that is some of those classes, a vast majority, are mandated by the state of Connecticut to meet graduation requirements. If you'll remember, graduation requirements are increasing to 24 um, or 25, and um, we need to have a variety of courses for students to be successful. Um, we also added courses um, to be part of a comprehensive, high-performing high school, is that you don't really want the soundbite to be, we offer just the courses mandated and nothing more. We want to make sure that we have a variety of classes that are going to position our students for success after high school. Um, and so I think we try to, again, be conscious of we can't just offer every course under the sun and we don't run classes with two students in them. Um, but we do want to have a, a variety of classes and we want students to take courses that they're interested in that are culturally and uh, academically relevant for what they're studying and prepares them for what comes next. Questions on those? No. Okay. Um, this gets into the measures or the uh, return on investment for the community. Um, whether or not we look at things like the U.S. News and World Report's ranking. Um, and if we don't think that's important, what do we think um, is an important way to measure our district? Um, and they wanted uh, specific other than AP. The interesting piece is that U.S. News, uh, one of the biggest indicators of their ranking is the AP exam, number of students that take it, how we perform on it. So. Um, Use it, using U.S. News and World Report's ranking is looking at um, the amount of students enrolled in AP courses. I would say, though, that as a district, we don't want to ever look at return on investment and the quality of our education based on any one indicator. And I would point back to Dr. Chiapetta's um, presentation earlier this year and the work that the Board of Ed's done on the Next Generation Accountability Index um, and those indicators and not just test scores, but things like 
uh, student attendance, um, the accesses to courses, the number of CTE courses, those college and, and technical education courses that we offer, uh, the graduation rate, the college enrollment rate, um, the college retention rate, all of those things are factored. The growth rates are all part of that next gen accountability. And so I think that there is a lot of rich data in that presentation. I put the link to it on the website so that um, anybody can look at all of the things happening in the district. Um, I think we try to present both what we're doing well um, and where we can improve on. Any questions on that? So in summary, I would say we have a couple slides left. This is the summary of what this budget does. Um, these are the priorities that we um, align this budget to, what we're doing for communication and transparency, collaboration and trust. Um, the initiatives or funding in this budget and where they tie to engagement and achievement and how our schools become more welcoming and inclusive. And then lastly, how we're preparing for students for what comes after high school. Um, again, this chart is the one that, that layers this in. We recognize right from the beginning that this budget is higher than the last five years. Um, we would also say that the insurance increase is higher than the last five years. When you control for the insurance increase um, in the proposed budget, we are right where we were the last two years at approximately 2-4% uh, percent increase. The average daily membership, um, for those of you who haven't been uh, watching every board meeting for the last couple of months, this is something that we've talked about several times. Um, the uh, shift in enrollment back and forth from town to town, this has the greatest impact on either town in any one year because the enrollment shift um, factors into the per student cost per town, which is how the regional district bills. Um, this coming year, um, or I guess this current year because the uh, enrollment is based on the October 1st of 2019 um, and that's what we build the projected cost for the next school year off of. That shift in October of this past year um, was the highest at least in recorded history and shift from Southbury to Middlebury or Middlebury to Southbury um, and so Middlebury absorbs the largest per student shift in any single year um, and Southbury kind of gains from having the largest um, drop in student enrollment in any one year. And so that certainly, while it doesn't impact how the schools build a budget, it's very much uh, impactful as to how the towns do that. And that wasn't lost on anybody in the building of this budget. Um, and it's something that we were conscious of. Uh, one of the questions that came up was about the edu educational cost sharing grant. This really has nothing to do directly with the school district and this is state money that goes to each town. Um, but you'll see that um, several years ago the state reworked the educational cost sharing formula. Um, and you'll see that over the last couple of years both towns have received an increase. However, the increase to Southbury was significantly more percentage wise and that was really driven off of where the formula was prior um, and how the uh, average income in communities was calculated uh, and so there was a um, like a catch-up factor that was added into the Southbury ECS formula um, and that accounts for some of the bump that you saw in the 2019-20 school year or financial year. This is money from the state to the towns to offset the cost of education. Questions on that? Um, one of the questions that came up was about the impact of that enrollment shift. Um, and so this is a little confusing um, because we put a lot of information on here. Um, but with the, the top row here is kind of what is for 2021. The middle row is if you controlled for the average daily membership and assumed no student increase, what that would be. I'm sorry, reverse that. Um, when you apply it to the current year's budget, so if you took the enrollment shift next year and you applied it to this year's budget, what would that have looked like? And then if you took next year's budget and assumed the same enrollment as this year, 
with no enrollment shift, what would that look like in the two towns? So you just have to make sure you, you follow the headings in each of these charts. Uh, the budget schedule, um, at this point, we're at the 25th now. This is the, the budget workshop. Um, April 6th, we're gonna talk about in a couple of minutes, but that's scheduled at currently for the budget adoption by the Board of Ed. And that is all I have. Um, any questions on that? Um, all right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Josh, for answering the questions. And uh, particular thank you to the Boards of Finance um, who submitted their questions. Um, always happy to answer budget questions. And thank you, Josh, for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, next, we're gonna move on to the, uh, the school budget impact from the governor's executive orders. All right, so I think I'm still sharing my screen. If you bear with me for a second. Yes. So um, the governor's executive order from, uh, I gotta just double check my date here, um, March 21st, which was whatever date that was, um, Saturday, um, is that um, he, uh, the executive order basically requires the regional boards of education to adopt their own budget and forego the referendum process. So we reached out to um, Shipman uh, and Goodwin, this is our uh, law firm, um, and asked them to put a um, opinion letter together that took the executive order and explained it and validated kind of the interpretation that we read um, and in there he um, Kevin is the attorney um, takes the section of paragraph 14 of that executive order that references regional boards of education and speaks to the process around reasonable steps to publicize the budget receive public comment, publishing draft budgets, um, but in the second part of that order, um, go down to the analysis here, uh, and I'll leave that up on the screen so I think everybody can read it, uh, that the Regional Board of Education must suspend in-person budget adoption requirements which includes the referendum. Um, it provides that the regional board shall adopt a budget, um, which otherwise complies with the requirements in section 10-51, which would be the uh, in-person budget adoption requirements. Um, it includes the budget meeting required votes, the referendum, the and special district meetings. Um, and that last sentence there is that it's, um, the language is equivocal that the regional board must adopt their budget without complying with any in-person adoption requirements. So what we kind of alluded to before is that based on this executive order and how it applies to regional boards of education, that the 10 of you will adopt the 2020-2021 budget um, and it will not go to referendum. Um, the other piece in my screen is um, cutting it off here. So give me a minute and I will pull it up. Um, but there was an additional memo from CABE on March 23rd, which talks about um, the suspension of in-person budget adoption requirements for municipalities. And again, you can see that they underline shall authorize the budget making authority to adopt a municipal budget. So according to this, the municipalities also must adopt their budgets. Um, without, and I'll leave it up on the screen so those watching from home, 
without holding votes required by charter or complying with any in-person budget adoption requirements. And then that same language is here, section 14, for regional boards of education. So back to like Ms. Dwyer's question earlier about making decisions about next year, um, I would caution everybody within earshot of this um, to move cautiously when making decisions uh, because orders like this um, very much change the landscape that we are working within and basically all of the rules with which we function. Um, and then in here, and both of these documents we'll make sure are on the website as part of the minutes for tonight's meeting. Um, and you'll see here that the district budget process, making arrangements for the public to watch and listen in real time. We're doing that this evening. Um, recording and transcribing the meetings, we're doing that. There will be on, um, this recording will be on the website. All the supporting documents and materials uh, relevant to this agenda will be on the website. Um, the required officials taking part in the meeting. You're doing this tonight. You're stating your name before you speak. Taking all reasonable steps. This is some work that we will do, including pu publishing the budget drafts on the website. So that will um, now happen. Normally that would happen after the April 6th meeting when there's the board adoption budget. Um, but in this case, we will be posting all of the budget documents on the website. Um, and then um, this is kind of the breakdown of their of Cabe's research around boards of education. Um, so I guess with that, one of the yeah. th thoughts, I don't know if you want me to continue now, um, but with the April 6th date is that that may be a date where um, Mr. Martino and I come back with some adjustments to the budget. Um, and because we are not going to referendum, the, the timeline of the April 6th may be less relevant and the board can uh, choose to use the April 6th date as a budget conversation um, and then set a different night uh, for the budget adoption. Um, but I think what we did with this agenda was carve out space for you to have that conversation. Um, I see Sharon Attic has a question. Hi, this is Sharon Attic. So thank you for sharing this information. I guess the first thing that comes to my excuse me that comes to my mind is um, getting this information this evening and recognizing this is a very dynamic space and things evolve. And I really appreciate um, you know having this conversation. How will I mean? Clearly, things are going to be um, put online. The recording, but really, how will this information be? conveyed it within the community because I would imagine that this could result in additional um, community comment mm -hmm. and while this was the opportunity to have that public hearing without this information being known that they would not necessarily be having a referendum I, I would imagine that could potentially drive additional comment so I'm just trying to understand um, what the plan is relative to really ensuring that this has been uh, more broadly communicated outside of just posting this meeting online. I think that that's a conversation that we wanted the board to have a little bit tonight as to um, what are your feelings? How do you want to do that? Um, you know, and I think we're certainly partners in that process, but the referendum for the most part is the board's piece and so we can certainly um, share some of this certainly online certainly the email address one of the cautions that is unanswered in this is historically the board of education cannot use our email structure to solicit parent comments or votes um, under freedom of information and the fact that if i send out an email with this information um, our distribution is to vested people in our work, their parents of this district. 
I don't have the ability to reach out to people who aren't in the school district. And so um, the reach of the email that I can send out to parents um, is limited um, and may not, you may not get input from folks that are not part of the educational structure if that communication comes directly from me. This is Sharon, may I ask a follow-up question? I'm oh, sorry. Sure. Yep, I just wanted to add one thing to what Josh was saying. Um, if, if When we do another meeting on August, uh, April 6th, um, that will also have an opportunity for public comment at that meeting. Um, in addition, you know, if we, whatever day that we uh, do the, uh, decide to do the budget vote, that day we'll also have um, a, an opportunity for public comment. And people always can email board of ed members um, and superintendent to get uh, more information or questions. I mean, you, you make a very good point, Sharon, that the, the sands have shifted. Literally, this was late Saturday night that the governor um, you know, just completely uh, changed the parameters of the referendum. Um, so it, it, there's been like a little bit of catch up and this uh, public hearing was scheduled for tonight um, by our regular scheduled uh, budget um, process. And um, I felt it was important to uh, maintain it um, and still have it there and provide the public for every opportunity they could to, you know, weigh in. Um, but again, there's going to be more opportunities for that as well. This is Sharon Attic, and I totally appreciate that. And I'm really glad we're having the conversation this evening. I guess I'm I'm just sitting in uh, putting my hat on as a community member, right, and saying, "Wow, the board of ed is going to be making a vote, and and certainly without a referendum." And I'm just thinking how that would and i'm hearing it impacts the municipalities right as well so yes. how what would the normal process be to communicate that out to the public that basically this is the proposed budget because usually that proposed budget is very publicly outlined in the paper it, you know that type of thing but the follow-up is and by the way it's not going to a referendum i think that the ability to have that be conveyed would certainly drive, at least allow people the opportunity to be able to comment and send emails and have a conversation because they won't they won't have a vote. That's that's kind of where I'm going. Do you want to take that, Josh, or do you want me to take a crack at it? I don't know that I have an answer for that. I mean, I think that's a good thing for us to talk about is what's what's our process? You know, I think those are good points of how do we communicate this out? Um, do we, we could still publish something in the paper. We could, we certainly have, you know, email access and people can call, but we are like, there's no formalized structure for this. And maybe the mm -hmm. other piece is to have a conversation with the two first selectmen about what they're thinking of, um, the, that publication piece because there is again there's there's no ground rules or, or path you know this is one of the most scripted procedures in the school district with specific dates and timelines um, that we literally start the budget process in February building back from what the timeline is in the charter now that all that's gone um, I, I think we do have to decide what what's appropriate how do you be transparent um, and how do you not kind of quote take advantage um, of a situation by not being transparent you know we we've been working to be transparent for two years um, this is maybe more important than before to be transparent great got um, Heather Rogers with the question and then see Steve Sirianni after her um, I think I would assume that the press is watching this tonight, but if they're not, um, maybe we could give them a heads up or a call. They can do a press release. I would think something like this would be reported in the newspapers, um, all the local newspapers. And also, I don't. I think it would be a good idea to reach out to um, the selectmen in both towns, and they have meetings coming up, and mention it to them as well, and get their take on, or at least have them mention it at their meetings as well. You finished, Heather? Oh, oh, okay. And then I would just add, um, so I would agree with, I think, everything everyone said. I think to Sharon's point, 
um, you know, uh, there, there, there really isn't a lot that, that we actually do, generally speaking, um, that we still cannot do, uh, that, you know, we can still do those things. As, as people have mentioned, there's normally newspaper stories. Uh, we can make sure that the editors, you know, reporters are aware, right, because it may not be as obvious to them. Um, there are emails, individual emails from Board of Ed members that go to their email list. I'm sure we can do that. Josh mentioned that we have not in in several, three or four years emailed through the school messenger system anything about budget referendum for the reason Josh stated. Uh, so I don't think we can do that this year um, unless that law got waived, but I, I don't think it has. Uh, yeah. So um ptos might normally uh also you know you blast their mailing list we can make sure they're up make sure they're up to date to me you know kind of what's missing is the who is not who's not tied to the school community and that's usually you know uh, older adults or seniors and i think what the virus is maybe impacting is i i, I think josh and certainly previous superintendents have done a couple uh, presentations in the village, or at least in South Barry and Heritage Village, that you know that we can't do now. So maybe the, the sort of the only makeup piece I kind of see might be to maybe make sure that you know South Barry has town e blasts. Maybe we we need to make sure that we're on those as well with all our information. And maybe there's a way of reaching out to the village, at least in South Barry, um, to. Uh, you know, they have their own sort of communications networks and whatnot. Maybe there's a way to get some, you know, some messages to them about what we're doing. Thank you. Just to jump in for a second, I could say both. I spoke to Dan Colty over in South Barry and also Bill Stoll on the Board of Finance in Middlebury. They're all grappling with the same issue because in reality, the selectmen can now set their own budgets as well. So, I mean, they're definitely, everyone understands the grappling of magnitude that people are dealing with. So I think, although maybe not out in the press, I think definitely the, the selectmen and the respective boards, both education and finance and selectmen, are, are considerably the impact of the actions they're all going to take. Because the boards of selectmen, in theory, will have their own ability to set, set their budgets as well. So... And they're aware of that, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep, okay, Sharon, I see you have a, yep. This is Sharon Attic, just a comment. That based off of what I'm hearing then, I would absolutely be in support of aligning with the communication pathway that the selectmen are adopting. So at least there's consistency and alignment because it impacts both of them. And it sounds like that is kind of been a message in, in some of the comments earlier. I just uh, wanted to add to that, thank you. What, what does that mean, an, an alignment with the selectmen? What do you mean by that? Um, this is Sharon Attic. So um, if, if- Sorry, both, I'm very man, so I forgot to say my name. If, if, both the, um, if the first selectmen, as well as the Board of Education, both are in the same position, right? That we have to adopt a budget without a referendum and a vote. I th I would like to think that there would be consistency to the public of how that message is conveyed. Um, certainly there were ideas about press and emails and those types of things, but I think a discussion with the selectmen to understand how they are going to be navigating this would be very beneficial. So if they're going to be doing one thing, maybe we could also adopt the same methodology. Yeah. So Josh, my question to you is, do the towns have the same restraints that we do about um, the, the quiet period? Like, does the quiet period even apply um, well, about not promoting our budget? Well, I would say in the vein of a very fluid world that we live in, at least the early reports, my understanding is that the governor had a seven o'clock press conference <coughs> where he suspended many of the FOIA laws, um, which is what drove that quiet period and our ability to use email as Steve was pointing out before. Um, so while we're in a meeting and I haven't actually read or seen um, any of those things, the reports coming to my phone right now um, are saying that some of the FOIA laws 
have been suspended. And maybe some of that is in response to the questions that we're talking about tonight. Um, as districts talk about, well, how do you publish uh, information on a budget if we're restricted? And so I, I think that um, I, I like it when like the news proves me right in the meeting. When I say we should move yeah. slowly and, and not make too many decisions and let some of this um, happen, we are, you know, it becomes a little bit cliche when we say unprecedented times. N not in modern history has the amount of executive orders coming out of Washington and Hartford been this extreme and this fast. And so I think it's prudent for us to digest, um, to read this, to talk to towns, not just our town management, but to school districts and other towns about how, we're, how they're handling this. Um, and then come up with a rational way to help the community understand what we're doing um, and to not, this wasn't, a, this wasn't designed so that we could take advantage of anybody's trust. Um, and I think we need to make sure that people know that that's not our intent uh, and to have that conversation. No, I, I think it's entirely um, appropriate to point out that we, we didn't see that, I didn't see this coming. Yeah. Um, I don't know anyone that saw the governor uh, doing this. And at, when, I, when I first read that executive order, I was in disbelief. Um, and uh, and I, I was also, um, you know, there's been subsequent art news articles that I've read um, that have been, uh, um, Mr. Watson actually forwarded me um, an, an interesting article that just talked about how um, the various uh, town uh, organizations uh, like the uh, CCM and cost thought this was a really great thing to um, they thought that you know uh, cost thought it was a crucial step to avert uh, fiscal chaos at the local government level and um, and and also CCM thought that you know this would be a, a great way to make sure that when the virus is over it's going to be a great way to get everything back up and running again um, so Sharon, I, I agree with you. I thought uh, this is a whole, uh, it's a shock. Um, I, I think the message tonight is, um, one of the messages is that we have no choice um, given the governor's directive. It's a, it's a direction that we have to do this. Um, I agree with you that um, you know, we need to have transparency and make sure the public has the ability to comment um, and I, and I don't know, Josh, like it, it, to, to, for, we'd have to look at that, uh, order about suspending, uh, FOIA in, in, I don't know. I don't, um, it's hard to say if I don't even have it in front of me, but I think we should just strive uh, part of our value as a board of education is to try to be as transparent as possible, um, in our, in our budget process. So we will continue to try to do that no matter what the. Governor does about the FOIA law. Well, I would just say that not the intent of the suspension of any of these things is about public safety and not about kind of allowing us to skip things that may have been in a, you know uncomfortable or more problematic or you know more complicated. That we should still make a good faith effort to do the normal course of business and to meet the mandates as best we can. Mm -hmm. And if we fall short of that, because our audio was malfunctioning in the beginning of an online public meeting, you know, like those kinds of things. Um, again, they were good faith efforts, um, not designed to limit people's voice or ability to weigh in. And I think that's, you know, we shouldn't read these mandates in that light. Great. I saw someone have uh, John Cookson and then Steve Sirianni. Um, just to let you know, okay, a suggestion or whatever you want to do. I have been in contact with the board members, the finance board members of Middlebury. Uh, some of the questions that appeared on tonight's BOF questions uh, came from Middlebury members. Uh, and they were very receptive that they could send anything they wanted to me uh, via email. And then I forwarded it off to Joe or Josh in reference to what was going on. Um, the other thing is Middlebury Finance members, the questions they got and what they're seeing is what has always been a problem overall with communication and stuff like that. So I want to th thank Josh and Joe for their 
participation in what occurred. Um, after tonight's meeting, I'll probably contact again all the finance members of Middlebury and say, did you see what we put out tonight? And do you have any more questions against it? Uh, and I have been in contact with Bill Stowell, the chairman, almost every single day. Um, I have talked with Joe, um, with Mr. Martino, talked to him this morning, I kind of liked it a little bit also. So I found that if, if I'm out there as finance chair and, and stuff like that, uh, this has been a, a good open communication to find out what they're doing and, and what's going on. All right, Steve. Uh, I would just, um, Again, thank everyone for their comments, uh, Marion and Josh and, and John. John, thank you for your work with Middlebury and, and, and Marion and your and Josh your previous comments. And I, I I agree, just because we you know maybe all the rules of FOIA don't apply, I think we 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 operate as if they do, you know, as best we can. Um, like you were saying, Josh, and um, and I agree with Sharon. We need to just make sure that if maybe ideally, if the board of selectmen in, in say Southbury sends something out about their budget, why aren't they sending something up? Uh, to saying sending something out about ours as well. And likewise, you know, maybe maybe if we are now able to use our email system, who maybe we can use that, and then we add in the bit about the town. So, but I, yeah, I don't I don't think anything is really changing as drastically, at least in the promotion piece as it has been in the past um and uh you know even in a good year unless we were cutting a music teacher uh you know we really never had that many people um show up to make comments so uh i, I don't i don't want to i guess overthink this i think what we've been doing what what people in charge of the district the administration and mary have been doing is absolutely in line with, with what i think we should be doing Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sharon, go ahead, Attic, Sharon Attic. Hi, this is Sharon Attic. So um, I guess just circling back to the suggestion that Josh had, um, where I understood April 6th was, was originally planned to be the Board of Ed vote on the budget. Can we kind of align on, on potentially having that be a further discussion so that we can ensure there is this level of transparency. And, and to Steve's point, um, while there in, typically may not have been a lot of uh, public comment, I, I personally feel that it would be very beneficial given this kind of unprecedented, you know, state that we're in, that we, if, if questioned afterwards when this does go, we can basically be very clear over what we did to increase the level of transparency and make sure that it was very clearly known the responsibilities that were placed on this group. Um, so if we can, you know, think about maybe shifting the budget um, vote anyway out and then using April 6th as a discussion, that would also help to um, align on some of those things. I don't know, it's just a suggestion. Yep. Um, I, I think the thought was that we would use April 6th, instead of doing the budget vote, we would have April 6th be an additional budget workshop um, where, you know, Josh would talk further um, on uh, recalibrating the budget in, in terms of uh, what's been going on. And then possibly April 20th, we have a regular board meeting that night um, and having that night be our referendum, or our, sorry, our budget vote that will be what passes. And again, at, at those meetings, there'd be public comment. Um, that's Steve, yeah, yeah, Steve and then John. Just when is the last day, like when's the latest we need to vote on the putting a budget for it? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think the, the governor also had, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, extended the budget deadlines by 30 days. That is correct. Okay. So we have like May, end of May, somewhere in there. No, no, beginning of May. No, I don't know. <laughs> so what I would say is our normal timeline would be May fifth uh, or sixth. Um, I think that um, the intent originally by that delay was to allow voting to happen later. What this order then did is change that to say um, 
holding a budget referendum later doesn't really help because boards of selectmen have to set mill rates and tax uh, rolls and things like that. So it's not helpful to towns to go past May. I would say, and uh, I know Joe's talking with the towns, but they would be more, it would make things more difficult for us to go later. While I don't think the, the April 6th date as, is as important as it might have been to set for it. All, again, all this was based on a July 1st fiscal. So then you back up to referendum to give the town time to set tax rolls. Then you back up to a board of ed vote so that you have time to structure the referendum and get ballots printed. If we don't have to do those things, the April 6th date becomes less important. But I would say you don't want to go beyond the original May date and that in some ways, mm -hmm. um, not that I speak for the towns, whatever the adoption is, good, bad, or indifferent, the sooner they know that, the more solid their votes and may or may not impact, uh, you know, this is the conversation we probably want to have with at least the selectmen. Mm -hmm. Having our budget before they adopt theirs may influence what they do with their town budgets. Yep, John Cook's in. Just a question for you, a hypothetical question. Is there any way that the governor would ever rescind this order or change it? Does he have that authority? I guess technically any executive order the governor creates, he can undo. Um, I think that they are not going to play with this um, and rescind it because as you heard from CCM and other municipal um, organizations, the financial instability of not having uh, tax rolls in place is, and the mechanics around that process are um, massive in their implications. So I, I mean, whatever, I'm one person, I don't see this as something the governor is gonna get in the habit of like monkeying with. It's out there. Um, it happened, kind of, we're all going to adjust to it, but I don't think they're going to pull it back. One thing I know, one thing I know, too, Middlebury wants to try and set their mill rate as soon as they can. They don't want to delay or whatever. They're, they anticipate what they want to do and get it out to the general public. Again, yeah, thank you. Sopri echoed the same. I think that's their same. All the towns, they want to set those. This, law, this executive order was about creating um, f financial certainty and minimizing the amount of uncertainty as towns build their budgets for July. Um, and so the intent of this was not to give people more time. It was really to be more efficient and get those things figured out earlier. Richard, did you have a question? Yes, Mary and I do. Okay. Uh, Executive Order Number 71 is uh, listed here as an opinion by our lawyer and by Kate's lawyer. Is that correct? Okay. Um, so, yeah. So there's two different um, memos that Josh showed you. One was from our attorney, and then another one was um, an opinion that was sent from the attorney within Cape to board chairs and superintendents also advising on the same topic. In what addition to what? Excuse me, wouldn't it be better if we actually had the order from the attorney general for, or from the governor's office? Well, we do have the uh, the order from the, the, the governor's office. We have the, the executive order directly from the governor's office. I thought we only had an opinion on the on the order, not the actual order itself. The governor did an executive order that applied to regional districts and to municipalities. So we asked the, the attorney to make sure what the proper interpretation of that was. And then Cabe also followed up with their own memo. Um, saying the same thing that our attorney said. Correct. But wouldn't it be better if it came from the attorney general from the state of Connecticut? So there's no, what's it called? There's, there's no comeback years from now or, or, or a year from now? Yeah, 
That's a, it's an interesting um, that's an interesting question, Richard. I don't think that would be within the attorney general's purview to do something like that. Um, uh, they don't. I, I don't think the attorney general's office opines generally on executive orders, especially this this uh, soon. We I I, I feel very um, comfortable that I, you know we had an attorney from Shipman and Goodwin uh, give an opinion on this, um, and again that Cade said the same thing um and that ccm and uh cost um all are very much in support of the executive order and it seems everyone seems to have the same interpretation including the towns that are part of the region richard what i'm sure richard what i'm sharing yeah, now it's is the to... list sorry Mary, but yeah. i did pull up and shared with you this is the um, list of executive orders, um, and you can just see that most of these executive orders contain um, lots of things, um, not necessarily related to schools. Here's where there's um, specific duties on state agencies, uh, personal filing, uh, I'm just scrolling through here, tax exemptions, uh, municipal decisions. Here's, here's section 14. Um, of the executive order. Um, I can hide this so people at home. But if you can see, if you go to ct.gov um, and go to the Office of the Governor, the list of executive orders, those executive orders are here. Um, the two documents we shared with you this evening ask, well, one we asked specifically our um, attorney to validate, but CABE and um, CCM uh, which is the council municipalities both have done the same we just did it our own independent in addition we're to take this section and to break out um, kind of the impact of this executive order because I'll, I'll, I know you're not gonna be able to read this and but if I scroll down like this is the executive order um, it's it's long and has a wide range it touches all kinds of things the executive order 71 specifically is about municipal operations and it goes on for somewhere it probably tells me how many pages but um, 13 pages where only that there's only one section of that section 14 that really applies to uh, regional school districts Are there any other um, questions or comments? Brian Watson. Hi, Brian Watson. Um, I, I, Josh, I understand that you can't anticipate any cost savings um, because you just don't know what's going to happen in contracts and things like that. However, I th you know, and I think you've alluded to this, that you can anticipate some um, cost increases next year based on what happened. Are you and Joe planning on like uh, changing the budget before the board on it so I would say that we wouldn't necessarily change the proposed budget um, what I would say is if we're gonna make April 6th a uh, budget workshop um, that what we could come to you with is kind of a little bit of a cost-benefit analysis on these are some things that we think there may be savings in here are some things that we may be able to do offsets next year here may be some potential liabilities for cost and what those might be you know, I think we spend a lot of time each day reading the tea leaves. Um, I think, and sh uh, Sharon asked this question last week, which was a good one of, if we don't run spring sports, um, you know, can we do something? What happens to the, the coaching stipends that aren't going to be paid because the cross didn't happen? One of the challenges is, even though the governor yesterday alluded to the fact that schools, uh, well, he said schools are definitely closed till April 20th, alluded to the fact that they may be closed the rest of the year, the CIAC is still saying, well, we're, we may try to run some spring sports if school opens. So for us to say, here's $60,000 in spring sport fees that we're not going to have to pay, and here's something we're gonna do with that. Right now, we're talking in a lot of, like everything's written in pencil really softly, and then I would say that every week that goes by, some of those things get more real, if we get to May and we're, it's clear that we're not gonna run um, spring sports, then we can come up with, this is what we're gonna do with those funds. 
the challenge for all of us is going to be I anticipate we're going to have to adopt a budget before all of those answers are in play. So, excuse me, I think we'll have to say here are the things that we know and then here's kind of the potential budget impact. I don't know if that's a good answer for you, uh, but I think that's kind I of where we're at. Are you planning on changing that number, the percent increase? I would say Joe and I are going to give you some options on how the board could change that number and what you're comfortable with. I don't know that we're going to do like a new like budget number. I think we would say here's the 359. Here are some things you could do to move that number down. Here are some things that you could keep in mind that could be potential cost increase. And then to have a decision among the board as to kind of where is the comfort and, and security and um, – we're well aware of all the financial implications of what's happening, the families that are going to be impacted, what tax rolls, and the fact that this is a pretty high budget increase, especially for Middlebury, where depending on what Southbury does, it may not have as much um, of a tax increase uh, or tax impact in the town of Southbury. That being said, if it's a difference between you know a quarter percent mill rate increase and a tax reduction, that still means something to, to the people in the community. And so um, what we don't want to say is kind of slash and burn and we're going to deal with the ramifications of this for five years because uh, we're undercutting the school district. How do we build a strong school district? How do we maintain the programs? But how do we also keep in mind that people may be hurting? And if there's something that we can do to make that better, I think that's what we're going to try to, to give you a path as a board to have a conversation of. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments about the budget? Peter, Shannon, just want to make sure you guys are still there. And uh, do you have any questions or comments? No, still floating around listening to what's going on. All right. Thank you, Peter. Shannon? I don't have any questions. Okay. All right. This is all a lot to process. Um, took me a, a, a long time this weekend, <laughs> um, thinking everything over and, you know, everything that's happening and how it impacts everything and permeates everything. It's, it's a lot. Um, and I just want to say I, I appreciate, um, you know, uh, Josh and Joe's job there's a uh, fluidity to all of this. It's just really hard to process also because you know we're, we're normally used to just having a budget and then the board asks questions and we come up with the budget and we uh, you know have our budget and then it moves to a referendum. So this is just a very different process. We want to make sure everyone is comfortable um, you know that your questions are answered. Um, if there's anything um, that you want to let Josh and Joe know now um, in terms of particular items in the budget that you're concerned about. Um, you know, voice your opinion now or you could do it again on April 6th um, or again on April uh, 20th. So. Yep. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. So um, I think normally even, you know, during a regular year, during budget season, there are still, um, you know, we do occasionally, we talk about things other than the budget. Um, so I'm wondering if um, if there's consensus, you know, on, on April, I suppose on both days, um, but I, I, uh, the 6th and the 26th, um, you know, maybe there should be uh, some, um, I want to say public discussion, uh, but just some, some, uh, you know, maybe a presentation from the superintendent uh, to the board about just the, where we are with, say, distance learning and, um, you know, the, the, the remote learning model, just, you know, it's sort of an update that is outside of the emails that are being sent, you know, given to the board in public, where in case we have any questions, you know, we can, we can, you know, we can ask them. Um, is a, a request of mine. Thank you. Right, and not, not to imply that communication has been great, and even the email yesterday was perfectly worded. <laughs> I, I just it just it, it really quelled a lot of discussions we were having here in my house 
uh, about how distance learning was going to going to work. So um, I'm not I'm not saying there's a ton of issues now. There you know, or there will be a ton of issues, um, additional issues. It just would be nice to um, you know sort of regroup um, you know at those touch points. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Smith, for your presentation. I uh, have announcement of future meetings. We have Monday, April 6, 2020, Policy and Curriculum Committee at the, well, it's at the Pump Rock High School Media Center conference room at 6.30, but that's going to be virtual um, as well. And same thing Monday, April 6, the Board of Education meeting, it's going to be at 7.30 um, that night as well. Um, and it looks like a, the April 6th meeting is going to be about, uh, the Board of Ed meeting is going to be about the budget, again, a budget workshop. So um, that being said, thank you everyone um, for your time tonight, and may I have a motion to adjourn? John Cookson, motion to adjourn, please. Heather Rogers, second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. Any nays? Okay. It passes unanimously. Thank you.